Welcome to the Final Ghost Podcast. This is Anna, co-founder of the Final Ghost Collective and your podcast host. If you're new to the show, every season we explore the intersections of horror film and feminism, looking at a particular trope in depth. We're going to be spending the next few months talking about the most elegant and the horniest of movie monsters, the vampire. In each episode, I'm joined by a special guest that are deep into a vampire film or two. We we'll discuss the movies in great detail, try to contextualize them, and occasionally make terrible jokes as well. Welcome to 2021. It's been a week, and I would like to unsubscribe already. We took a little break last week to properly set into the new year, but not to worry, we're back on a regular schedule of weekly vampire film discussions that will be coming out every Friday. And today, to mark what would have been David Bowie's 74th birthday, we bring you an in-depth conversation about The Hunger. This 1983 erotic vampire horror was directed by Tony Scott and boasts what's probably one of the most beautiful casts ever committed to film, including Bowie himself, Catherine Deneuve, and Susan Sarandon. The film is a gorgeous, moody love triangle between a vampire couple and the sleep specialist who they recruit to help when one of them starts aging rapidly. Miriam and John, played by Bowie and Deneuve, are living their best goth lives hunting for human blood in New York nightclubs, but something weird starts to happen when John ages years in only a few days. I'm joined in this episode by the wonderful Steph McKenna to discuss this goth cult classic. There is a lot of chat about billowing curtains, by the way, and a lot of chat about Bowie. It's safe to say I'm a massive fan. And if, like me, you're looking to pay tribute to the multifaceted genius that was David Bowie, The Hunger is an excellent place to start. This entire vampire season is made possible with the support of our video, who bring you the very best in cult, horror, and genre films, specializing in deluxe, definitive, home entertainment editions with uncut versions and specially curated extras. Their collection is now vast and spans over 500 releases, and throughout the season, we're recommending a film that we love from their vast collection. And this week, our pick is Black Rainbow, a genuinely chilling supernatural gothic thriller directed by Mac Hodges, which sees a traveling clairvoyant who starts foreseeing murders. With that said, if you're new to the podcast, please know that we discuss the films in detail pretty much from the very beginning. If you're averse to any discussion of a film before you watch it, consider this your spoiler warning. And if you don't really mind and just want to hear two people gush about David Bowie and Susan Sarandon and Catherine Deneuve, then please enjoy our discussion about The Hunger. Hi, Steph. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor. Well, it's really exciting because we've been following each other on social media for a while, but we've never actually spoken. No, I finally get to hear your lovely voice. Well, um, thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I sorry think it's lovely. <laughs> You're really sweet. But also, as you know, this is my way of making friends is that I just ask people to podcast with me and then by default, automatically we're friends. Oh, well, yes. Works. Besties for life now. <laughs> that makes me very happy. I'm really excited that when we talked about you coming onto this podcast that you wanted to talk about the hunger. Yeah, I I pounced on it from the list, to yeah, be honest. <laughs> so tell me, what is your relationship with this film? When did you first watch it and has your opinion of it changed over time? I remember first seeing this film as kind of a young adult. I think I must have been 17 or 18. Drawn to it firstly because of David Bowie. Mm -hmm. obviously big long time Bowie fan and was just I think at that point trying to absorb everything you know anything he'd released anything he'd been in um and then also because of the soundtrack Bauhaus Iggy Pop an immediate draw I was mm -hmm. sort of beginning to explore a lot more kind of goth and post-punk and new wave music uh I was a young goth I'm an old goth now uh you know big big fan of the music so that drew me in Firstly, and I remember having to buy it from HMV or wherever it was, hard copy DVD because I couldn't get hold of it anywhere. And Good times. Yes, even the front cover, you know, Bowie in the mm. sunglasses, uh, Catherine Deneuve, you know, her sweeping hair. I was just so impressed with the aesthetics of it, just even on the cover and reading the blurb on the back. So, um, and I remember when I first watched it, just absolutely losing my mind over that opening scene, just freaked out. 
the goth club, the the outfits, the music, the sex. It's just vampires don't get any cooler than this. They really don't. It's oh, I just I remember being so enthused by that opening, and yeah, just I I do remember being slightly surprised after that opening that um it, the the pace kind of slows and it's almost it is a horror film but it's almost a bit of a an erotic drama thriller as well and um i really i enjoyed the really strange marriage uh, this film has between sort of high and popular culture which you know i use those terms quite quite loosely but there's that mixture of sort of classical music and 80s subculture and high fashion and sex and I, yeah at the time i absolutely loved it like mostly from a very uh not superficial point of view but I just loved the look and the feel mm. and the atmosphere of it and I I rewatched it I've seen it a few times uh I rewatched it recently with my partner who I I don't know how hadn't seen it before we, we lived together for like 7 years how we haven't watched it together before I don't know <laughs> but I watched it the other day with him and rewatching it there would, I mean, I would defend this film. I really enjoy this film. And I'm so glad that speaking to you in advance, you said you like this film too, because I almost thought I'd have to come prepared to defend it. <laughs> no. But I also, I do know that there are moments that are a bit cringe and mm. there are, you know, there are certainly some things that uh, don't work as well about this film. So I can't, I can't blame people if they're not so keen on it, but at the same time, you know, in in terms of the way that these vampires are sort of physically presented, mm. they're just some of the most beautiful and just the coolest vampires you're going to see in a film. I mean, honestly, you've kind of nailed it. They do make vampires look extremely cool and extremely of the of that era as well. Yeah. I feel like, you know, you've mentioned post-punk and new wave and this goth aesthetic. And we'll dig into the opening scene because I'm mm. absolutely obsessed with that scene. Yeah, me too. It has been for years. And I think it was probably one of the first, I think it was probably the first time I heard Bauhaus as well, mm. which then became one of my favorite bands. Oh, I love it you're right it kind of captures this moment in time and Bowie and Catherine Deneuve and Susan Sarandon and Peter Murphy from Bauhaus kind of at the epicenter of cool yeah I wanted to ask you first before we dive into the film itself how do you think this fits into how vampires had been presented up until that point how does it make them cool compared to what they were like before for me this film because it's 1983 isn't it so mm -hmm. it's this weird kind of marriage between the like the the hyper sexualization the real the erotic films vampire films of the 70s and then when you're moving into the 80s because you've got all of the you know the golden age of special effects and mm. it, there's a lot of films that are very uh they prioritize style and look um very much especially with vampires when i think of 80s vampires i think of the lost boys and near dark you know mm -hmm. very cool rock and roll vampires so i guess for me this film almost sits as a marriage between the two like vampires are really horny but they're also very cool and they look great <laughs> In a nutshell, that's my Wikipedia entry for this I film. Love it. <laughs> but it, it it's a film that takes itself much more seriously mm. than uh, some of the the later eighties vampire films as well. It's sort of these are art house vampires, aren't they? They're... Yeah, there's a lot of drama there. There's mm. a lot of moodiness. Like they're horny, but they're also sad. It's yeah. kind of <laughs> it's a, it's a kind of a definitely not stylistic predecessor. Mm. But it is almost a predecessor to Louis in Interview with a Vampire in the yes. way that they show vampires as kind of burdened and really sad about the fact that they're beautiful and young and horny and can live forever. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, vampirism, you think vampirism would be great. You live forever. You, you know, you're so wealthy. You're so attractive. You're so beautiful. But I think Miriam even says herself, like, mm. we're damned. Yes. This is this is an affliction. And I mean, you know, for her, she's the the original vampire. But mm -hmm. for for those that she turns, you know, vampirism is quite literally a bloodborne disease. It's an mm -hmm. invasive strain of blood that comes and transforms them. It's, you know, it's something that often happens to them against their will as mm. well it's and it's yeah it makes it makes you it, they're just so sad why are they so sad and horny <laughs> <laughs> so let's dig into the film itself proper mm. we've sort of gushed about the scene already but i really want to rip it apart so to speak yes and let's talk about that opening scene where we get 
the the hunt of the vampires of Miriam yes. and John, and we also get essentially a full performance by Bauhaus of Bella Lugosi's dead in the sort of goth club cage. Yes, we've got we've got shots of Peter Murphy, haven't we, in his yeah. in his cage, juxtaposed with caged monkeys at Sarah's medical center, and um, oh, it's just. It's just amazing, and it's you. You you've got all these quick edits, these close ups of teenagers dancing mm. and the strobe lighting, and that's kind of interspersed with these close ups of John and Miriam in the most amazing outfits. And I think I think the first thing you see is Bowie, and then you and his sunglasses, and then you see mm. Miriam, and they're they're choosing their prey together, and they're in that first scene they're almost they they present as equals. They're both kind of in control yes. of the situation. They're seducing these young people from the mm. club with their looks and their wealth um and yeah bringing bringing them back to to have sex with them but then but then to kill them and it's interesting in the way that that first scene really places us in a time and a place like we were talking mm. about before and also because we see so many people in that club these goth kids mm. it's stylistically sets apart Miriam and John because they are I don't know if you got the sense as well of kind of they look different. Like mm. they stand out in the way that they almost are unmoving, like beautiful statues. Yeah, everyone's looking at them, aren't yeah. they? As as we are as well. I mean, it's, you know, how could you not if you were in that club? There's, there's all these lovely young people, but these, uh, yeah, as you say, they are like statues. Mm. And what do you make of the way that, because this is one of the... Uh, one of the most violent scenes in the film mm. and it's straight at the beginning mm. so what do you think of the way that they actually hunt humans and how they mix their seduction of them for sex mm. versus their seduction of them to kill them and drink their blood i mean they're using they're using the sex aren't they very much the, the sex and the violence and the feeding goes very much hand in hand in this film so uh the the violence is taking place during that sex and during that seduction um, and I guess sex is being, you know, it's being weaponized. It's something that vampires have been doing for a very long time. Mm. They're, they're using their, um, their class in a way. I see that, you know, they're, they, they're the wealthy Manhattan elite, aren't mm. they? And they're coming into this club, mixing with these sort of, you know, 90s teenagers and they're bringing their money and their, uh, their amazing fashion. Uh, and they're using all of this to kind of envelope these young people and bring them in. And what do you think of the way that they actually kill their prey? Because one of the interesting things about mm. this film is that they never actually bite people. No, they don't, do they? They have like an anchor yeah. pendant, which I th is that symbolizes life, or I think Miriam says it sort of symbolizes endless life. And they use that instead rather mm. than, yeah, making sort of physical contact and biting people. And that's one of the vampire um there's sort of a few there's a few vampire tropes we get in this that are, seem almost classic you mm -hmm. know they are they're wealthy they're um you know they're very well spoken they're very attractive but at the same time there's a few things that really break away from that convention of vampirism mm -hmm. so they yeah as you say they don't we don't see them with any fangs they certainly don't bite anyone you can see them in mirrors you can mm -hmm. see them in photographs and apparently they don't live forever necessarily as well so they, there's quite a lot of break in convention here as mm -hmm. well and you see the sort of uh some of the practicalities of how hard it must actually be to be a vampire before we move into the characters themselves i just want to shout out one of my one of my favorite bits of trivia which mm. i don't usually bring up in, in this podcast but i just love it is the fact that peter murphy was such a big bowie fan oh i bet oh and they met on on the set on the set of filming this particular scene and apparently bowie went to say hello and he was so nervous that he uh, just drank a half a bottle of brandy and then just like <laughs> just thrust the other side of the bottle to bowie he's like oh, I'm a fan. drink with me drink <laughs> yeah. with me i mean you would wouldn't you i don't know how much booze i'd have to down to face david bowie it would just be i mean yeah i would but be just i would turn into a statue as if he were Medusa, I'd be like, mm. I, speech, no, no, mm. just oh no. And but we see we see um, Peter Murphy first, don't we? I think we see him the very opening shot before we even see 
Bowie. So he's, yeah. I mean, he's the opening shot of this entire film. Mm. It's amazing. Which I find really interesting because their whole, like, it's a little bit of mixing um, wider pop culture and mm. music in particular and kind of this this era and this aesthetic that was happening with new wave and post-punk and goth music and the subcultures mm. of it that peter murphy looks like a vampire like what we expect a vampire to look like oh yeah in this film perfect perfect choice for uh for a band and as you say they're playing mm. bella lugosi's dead which, yeah. you know they were quite literally saying <laughs> you know this isn't the bella lugosi vampire that you're used to seeing this is something completely new and different exactly it's and not I... even on the nose i love it <laughs> Yeah, I just I love the fact that they they give, they give that performance and that song and mm. so much space and so early on in the film, it almost kind of tricks us into thinking that he might be a character or a vampire and actually no, it's it's they're much more hidden away in the shadows and not yeah. being as performative about their their um vampirism as as these musicians are. Mm. And I mean, there's almost a bit of trickery in that you, I remember when I went into seeing this film first, thinking that this is, you know, David Bowie, obviously his mm. character is a key key player, but I, I thought, you know, the main crux of the story would be uh, Miriam and John, but John's not actually around for that much. <laughs> You're right. So what do you think about them as characters? Because you're absolutely right. It kind of tricks us into thinking that it's going to be all about their dynamic. And it's not that much about John. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of Miriam front and centre, really, isn't mm. it? As I, as I said before, you're, you're introduced to them almost on equal footing. They seem like an equal couple in all ways. And then we find out quite quickly um, with them in the shower that, you know, John's asking forever and Miriam is, isn't replying. She's actually quite cold and distant with him and you you find that Miriam's actually she's in control in pretty much in in every situation she is the one that's um she's the dominant partner regardless mm. of you know someone's gender or their status in society because when we meet Sarah as well she's we've got two very strong leading ladies in this we've got we've got Miriam and we've got Sarah who's a doctor and she works you know she's leading this project about aging and she's got a team of uh, men and women below her she, you know even her boyfriend seems to work for her and then she meets Miriam and very quickly becomes uh subordinate to her mm. I guess um, it's I just it's an amazing piece of casting, all three of them, really. And Miriam, I kind of come back to so much because she's this femme fatale in in looks and behaviour. She's kind of she's calculating, and she's so she's so seductive, but she's also quite she quite cold, and she's just so damn attractive. And there's that part of her as well that she's mysterious and attractive because she's European I think Sarah <laughs> says something about you know she's that kind of woman she's European she's you know she's not just <laughs> she's not just exotic because she's quite literally a vampire she's also not from this country yeah <laughs> it's, uh, I, oh, it's just she's just yeah she's front and center isn't she and she everyone around her plays into what she needs mm. and she is uh she's 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 lied to john for 200 years so mm. she's told him that they're going to be together forever they're married um and he's very quickly learning in this film that actually he's going to die very soon or when i say die not not literally die he's going to age very very quickly and then he's going to spend the rest of his life as this poor husk in a in a casket upstairs um and he doesn't get any say in that whatsoever she's not she's not willing to let him go she has all of the power in this situation Yes, it's such a fascinating power dynamic. Mm. And as well, the interesting thing about her relationship with all her, let's call them vampire offspring, mm. who are also all of them her lovers, mm. is that she makes them, she, she controls them. And then, as you mentioned before in the scene in the showers, she withholds very important information from them. So she kind of leads them in on a fake promise. But then at the same time as John is starting to age and, you know, disappear so to mm. speak she's already grooming two other people yeah yeah she's she... grooming sarah and the little kid which yeah. is extra creepy and extra totally extra creepy. went over my head when i saw this as a kid 
I think it did to me as well. I think there's a point where Alice says, like, oh, Miriam's my best friend. And it's mm. like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 she is, you know, yeah, she's, we think she's so attractive and cool, but she's so manipulative. And, yeah, this predatory behaviour, not mm. just towards uh, Sarah, but toward, towards a literal child. She's already got her eye on Alice. As you say, John, John realises, like, that game is up way before he, you know, he has to be packed away in a box, mm. bless him. Everything is on her terms. It really is. And Sarah, um, I mean, Sarah is attracted to her, but I think before they before they even have sex with that extremely famous sex scene, you know, mm -hmm. Sarah's thinking of Miriam all the time and it seems to be completely beyond beyond her control. It's almost like it's fate or there's some sort of, you know, this magnetism, this magic mm -hmm. power that's that's pulling her in. She uh, she sees Miriam in a mirror. She hears the phone ring. Uh, she sort of senses her playing at the piano. I think there's a bit where Miriam's... Uh, I think she's thinking of Miriam in her sleep or mm -hmm. and she's crying when Miriam's crying at the same time. They're becoming in sync even before they've actually swapped blood. Yes. And I think this is a good moment as well to bring in the, the big bisexual energy of mm. this whole film, especially through Miriam and Sarah's character. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on the way that their attraction and the sexual relationship between them is treated by the film. It's kind of, I, and I flip flop with mm. this a bit, actually, because, um, yeah, I definitely, you know, read this as a bisexual film and all three le leads appear to be um, bisexual. And we've I, I like the fact that um, I, I remember when I read, for example, like when I read Bram Stoker's Dracula, one of the things that uh, Jonathan Hark is really tortured by, actually, mm. is that he he's attracted and he's thinking about Dracula. But this, you know, not only is that, you know, a complete stranger, but he's also male. So mm -hmm. it, it becomes a real issue for him. It's kind of like, what am I doing? Why am I thinking this? And this, you know, this isn't a thing for Sarah. We don't get any sense of, we don't know whether Sarah, uh, this is the first woman Sarah's been attracted to, or, mm -hmm. you know, whether she's had lots of female lovers, but they're all just quite naturally bisexual. To be honest, that makes sense for any vampires. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, like, if you're a straight vampire, that's what, what's your damage? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, come on, you just, you'd be eating all the cake, wouldn't you? You'd I mean, just... if, you, if you're going to live forever, like, come on. You just, uh, yeah. I, you absolutely would. That's one of the benefits, really, of living forever. Is <laughs> it, yes. you know, it's brilliant. But but the sex scene itself feels. Um, I mean, I laugh every time I watch this sex scene. I don't know about you, <laughs> but it's the, it's that you try to seduce me, and then the oh, I've just dropped this accidentally dropped this sherry on my boobs, and I appear to not be wearing a bra. So thankfully, that's not going to get stained as well. But it's it's just it, absolutely hilarious with the billowing curtains and the it's all very serious, but absolutely makes me die every time. I mean that. <sighs> I think it was probably titillating when I was a teenager. And then when I rewatched it this time around, I was like, yeah, sure. Absolutely guffawed. I did yeah, guffaw like, this oh, time. It was. No, I appear to have some red liquid right around my erect nipple. <laughs> Let me take off my shirt as I would in front of a complete stranger because we're both ladies. So it it's... does not matter. I just. <laughs> like, uh... What? makes me absolutely <laughs> die but uh, but it is uh, i mean it's it's yeah it's as you said it's played quite straight and it is i guess there is an element of i don't know i want i want to take it seriously but at the same time it's so uh, it feels quite dominated by the male gaze as yeah. well like this is uh, is this not just for like guys to watch and go yes susan sarandon's <laughs> boobs <laughs> But the thing that I find really uh, interesting is that actually the chemistry between them, between mm. Catherine Deneuve and Susan Sarandon is great. Yeah. Like they don't feel like, like Catherine Deneuve has this sort of icy beauty mm. and icy star persona about her anyway, mm. which works really well. And Susan Sarandon kind of has, you know, like she, she genuinely, there is a genuine chemistry between them. So that part kind of then offsets the very male gazy way yeah. of directing it yeah and to be honest if this was the only scene that had that many billowing curtains i'd be like come on guys <laughs> but because it's, there's a lot of curtains throughout the whole film i'm like well suffocating <laughs> in them they're everywhere <laughs> i've never seen so I've... much fabric it's like a laura so... ashley store in there there's so much of it <laughs> 
And also, you know, it's this very slow motion sex scene that I'm like, come on. <laughs> like, no one's. With the no music as well. Oh, like, no one's going to get off like this. Like, this is just slow motion. Yeah. What is I just, happening? That's why I can't. I really can't make up my mind about it. Sometimes, sometimes I feel quite critical of it. And then mm. other times I'm like, you know what? It's pretty good. Yeah, I'm kind of into it. It's, I don't know. <laughs> Do you lean either way? Do you feel. I'm kind of with you. I think it's like I was mentioning before, the fact that the chemistry between the two actresses Mm. uh, is quite palpable. Yeah, it is. I think they're they're performing it well. Mm. It doesn't feel hammy or just Mm. placed there for um, because of the the director or anything like that. That feels like a a, a natural dynamic for them. Mm. But uh, yeah, the the visual direction of it is very late 90s early 2000s erotic thriller for a tv not even for cinematic yeah it's so yeah yeah yeah, it's like movies for men level kind of straight to to, yeah absolutely you're you're so right i think you film trivia time again um i'm sure i read (laughs) i read something about how in the film originally Tony Scott wanted uh, Sarah, so Susan Sarandon's character, uh-huh. to be drunk, and Susan Sarandon insisted that she didn't. The character didn't need to be drunk because, yes. I mean, who needs to be drunk to to uh, to have sex with Catherine Deneuve? Like, yeah. you, you don't need to be inebriated for that. We all we all want to sleep with her. Like, you know, yeah. uh, going back to that chemistry, you know, mm. I, I wonder if Sarah herself was like. You know what? We've got this. Like we don't, we don't need to introduce alcohol to, into the equation. Yeah. That is not necessary. No, I, I think I've heard that somewhere before as well, and it actually makes complete sense. Like she's mm. not wrong, yeah. and it gives Sarah and her kind of going with her desire, whether it's kind of manipulated by Miriam, mm. which is totally, I think, a very fair reading, mm. or whether it's genuine and kind of mutual. Mm. Um, the ambivalence of that is mm. also quite attractive. It's that thing of like, are you attracted to her because she's a vampire that's sort of hypnotizing you yes. with her supernatural powers? Or are you attracted to her because she's Catherine Deneuve and she's gorgeous and has this whole like goth countess of darkness mm. vibe going mm. on? Yeah, and that that's often the case with vampires actually, isn't it? I'm going to make mm. a really horrible Twilight reference here. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, Bella Swan, is she, you know, is she attracted to Edward because he's a vampire? Is he just using his vampire powers on her? Mm. Or, you know, do they have a genuine chemistry? I think that comes up quite a lot. I'm so sorry for making a Twilight reference. You are forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> what an awful thing to do. I'm cringing myself now. I Steph, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> Sticking on on Miriam and Sarah for a mm. bit, um, because this feeds into something you mentioned before of Sarah and Miriam be- both being really, really strong, strong characters with a lot of agency in and yeah. of themselves. Mm. Um, and their relationship is quite different, I think, from the ones that we've seen Miriam have with John and mm. even the, the, the girl that she's grooming, essentially. It's a girl, mm. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, she's quite. Alice is quite androgynous, isn't she? Yeah. I think when I first watched it, I, I thought maybe she, Alice was a boy, but yeah, yeah. Okay. But um, what I was going to ask is, how do you think their relationship develops because of Sarah's uh, own very strong personality? Because she she's transformed against her will mm. in that sex scene into a vampire, mm. but then she confronts Miriam about it, and she. Kind of refu- she tries to kill herself because she refuses to be one of these creatures. Yeah, she's she's definitely not buying it, is she? She's not sticking around for it in the way that John did. She, I mean, and Sarah's got so much background in this, hasn't she? She's you'd almost expect her to be to be happy to be a vampire because she's been spending her entire career trying to work out the secret to to mm. longevity and to you know staying young and living forever. And Miriam is quite literally giving her that. She says, you know, I I'm, I'm giving you this gift you know this is this is kind of what you wanted to know to live forever and it's absolutely not what sarah wants and she she tries to take back that power as you Mm. say from miriam by by essentially trying to kill herself Mm. and uh and they're they're in the middle of uh are they in the middle of having sex again am i they're sort of 
gearing up to it, I think. They are. They're gearing yeah. <laughs> there's, there's some foreplay and then she take, the takes the pendant, that's it. That's right. And then um, yeah. attempts to, because, she, you know, she doesn't, she's taking that control back. That's quite a bloody scene as well. Mm. Um, it's probably one of the goriest ones. What do you think of the of the actual violence in the film? Because there's a lot of billowing curtains. There's a lot yeah. of great performances, <laughs> great clothes, which I'm definitely going to come to in a mm. bit. But what do you think of the actual horror elements of the film? This is the thing. I don't, it's not a particularly violent film, mm. is it, really? Mm. Although there are some key moments, as you say, that opening with the, I think actually the, the images I always remember in the, the beginning of the film are the images of the monkeys after they've been kind of torn apart. There's some mm -hmm. horrible monkey corpses at the beginning of this film that just haunt me. And that is very violent. And then you've got this, yeah, this violence towards the end with Sarah. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a particularly violent film, I don't mm -hmm. think. Not a lot of blood is shed. And John and Miriam are pretty neat about the way that they, <laughs> as you say, using this pendant instead mm -hmm. of their teeth. So it doesn't, it does play in a lot of ways as you say, as a kind of erotic thriller <laughs> rather than a horror film. Although I would still argue it is a horror film, I think. Yes, I would argue that. I mean, I would agree. Mm. And I think when I was looking into it again, it was billed as a erotic horror, which mm. considering that those are two things that I'm most interested in in cinema. Yeah. I had never like realized that was a whole subgenre until this year, basically. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> I've got to say I'm not a I'm I'm not an expert on erotic horror, but um but sex and sex and death and sex and horror do go hand in hand yeah. so much, don't they? And yeah, especially with vampires. But I would like to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well you can learn, there's all the time. You can oh, exactly. uh, you're learning through this and <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and vampires themselves, I mean, mm. they are, the the actual act of feeding, <laughs> the actual act of, of feeding on humans is so, um, so personal and so intimate, yeah. and you are quite literally swapping bodily fluids, so oh, exactly. I think when it comes to vampires, just, you know, death and sex are absolutely hand in hand, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. And sticking on to vampires, what do you make of the of the mythology and the rules of by which vampires operate? And and I know we only really see Miriam and how she operates, but I do find it quite interesting that her her promise of eternal youth and eternal life is actually it has a it has a small print. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I almost didn't quite under I, I just seem to vaguely remember almost missing the point when I first mm. watched this and I can't quite remember why but yeah she's I think I didn't quite realize that John hadn't been clued in <laughs> entirely when I first watched this film but, but yeah she's yeah. she's she's pretty vague about it isn't mm. she she's um you come into this film with the expectation that yes these are these are vampires almost as we have known them before they're um They've got this amazing apartment. They've had all the years, you know, hundreds of years to build up a mass wealth. I always worry that if I was a vampire, I'd end up like never being able to climb the career ladder or something and just being <laughs> stuck being just not with a lot of money for hundreds of years. But they do really well for them. Yeah, they do yeah. really well for themselves. They're well dressed. They're well presented. They're so elegant. Mm. You know, they're extremely talented musicians. They love classical music. Um, and I've almost forgotten my point, which was... We've got the, um, yeah, so they're presented as the vampires that we, we, we already know. So they're very wealthy. They're very elegant. They're very, uh, you know, they love classical music. They're very experienced and talented. But, um, and we assume they're going to live forever because she, Miriam herself is this ancient, I think ancient Egypt, isn't it? Yes. We definitely know she was around in ancient Egypt, those lovely flashbacks. So we assume that they're going to, you know, they all live forever. And as you say, it completely, it completely subverts the idea of um of eternal eternal mm -hmm. life because they they are going to you know they are going to sleep in a coffin but actually it's not going to be the it's not going to be the the sleep and the youth that you'd expect they are john and all of these kind of human i guess they're human hybrids it's they they're all destined mm -hmm. to um just suddenly grow old and they're they're going to be stuck for the rest of their lives and they're not going to be allowed to rest because Miriam won't let them rest. It's such a good point. I also did not 
clock her mm. machinations. I think mm. when I saw this film when I was younger, mm. but it definitely stood it stood out this time round because she and it makes her a lot more interesting. I think mm. as a character who's extremely manipulative and mm. selfish, mm. and also it has this expiration date on so vampires, which like as a natural expiration date so mm. they will at some point start to grow old so their body will age but they will not die mm. and that's clearly something that the movie tells us that she knows about all along and she just selfishly uses these people lures them in with this with the promise that we're all familiar with you know do you want to live forever and be young and you will have to be drinking human blood so you will be an addict for the rest of eternity mm. But, yeah, you know, and the alternative is you get to stay young and pretty and powerful forever and yeah. live with me. <laughs> exactly. And we, as I referenced before, when she's in the shower mm. with John and he's kind of almost desperately hoping that she's going to respond to him. You know, he's asking forever. Yeah. You know, we said forever and ever. And she very coolly avoids, you know, just washing her hair, coolly avoids having to say anything back. And then yeah. when when she... Um, when she forces her blood into Sarah, mm. we we revisit the whole situation again. She mm. she runs by the entire, you know, repeats the entire process and says to her exactly what she said to John two hundred years before. So she's yes. she's certainly not going to change. Yes, You're and so right. and you know, vampirism is also very. Um, it's approached in quite scientific terms in this film. It's almost a bit science fictiony in that it is this blood borne disease, almost mm. like a. Not a zombie disease, but do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's invading the host. It's transforming yeah. human hosts into vampires. There's a very scientific basis to vampirism, which I find really interesting. But at the same time, I don't quite understand why Miriam is a sort of, I don't know, a, a pure original vampire and why her like how we don't really know how she began or how she was formed. So yeah. it's interesting that I don't, I'm not quite sure what the difference is between her and all of her offspring. Yeah, we're not really given much here. And no. it's, it should be noted that Miriam as an ancient Egyptian <laughs> is not... No. Not okay. Not great. Like, just whitest like, woman alive, not Egyptian. Yeah, you just can't just not. like dust a bit of makeup on her and hope for no. the best. It's very awkward, isn't it? And yeah. I think apart from kind of guessing like oh yeah this must just mean she was around in mm. in ancient egypt those flashbacks actually can be a bit confusing you kind of think like what the hell is is that her yeah i think it is her yeah that yeah. i think that's just her back in the day or because it does, a, yeah because they do kind of blend in with the rest of the mm. billowing the billowing curtains essentially serve as like a transition technique where they yes. go from one scene to another um I'm going back in time through <laughs> the billowing curtains <laughs> yes. yep but it's it's funny that um and I looked it up before actually because in Anne Rice's Queen of the Damned the mm. book not the film mm. um which we will cover later on in this podcast I'm so excited for that <laughs> there um the idea of this kind of vampire queen the original vampire from whom the rest of vampires stem mm. is also an ancient Egyptian queen and mm. the titular queen of the dam but uh her name in the in the story is akasha but they that book came out a few years after this film came out yes in 88 and this is 83 so this idea of kind of an original vampire does i think pop up occasionally mm. in 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 literature and mm. in other in other films and series but it's one of the things I think of kind of this wider vampire mythology that becomes mm. um, very malleable and very flexible. Like people can mm. just essentially give you the bare minimum explanation and just say, oh yeah, she, she was the original or whatever. Like it all started with her because you, <laughs> You're so true. Because you kind of want, you kind of want and don't want the origin story because mm. I don't know about you. I just want to spend some more time with Catherine Deneuve and David Bowie and Susan Sarandon being fabulous in the eighties. Oh yeah, yeah. You you can I, I I can quite easily forgive the plot holes in this film, <laughs> and there are quite a few. I, it definitely doesn't. Uh, it's not now. I don't think the narrative, the the story, isn't mm. exactly the most important thing here. I don't think, and the ending is a really big example of that. When Miriam's uh, former lovers or 
elderly, poor elderly lovers who've been locked in boxes all come come back and, you know, to, to surround and consume her. Mm-hmm. And I have no idea why they've just chosen to wake up. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? why? I mean, it looks very cool. The, the prosthetics in this yes. film are like really impressive, I think. And watching David Bowie, his physical transformation in particular mm. is... Um, it's heartbreaking. Actually, it's really sad, really heartbreaking. I think especially because it is David Bowie and David Bowie should live forever. <laughs> he's yes. the sort of person who should be immortal and he's, he's well, he's very obviously not, but he's also not in this film. But the prosthetics are amazing. That's a bit of a tangent, isn't it? Mm, but, no, but what, I couldn't agree more with you. But um, but yeah, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on, on the ending. Mm, the ending is, I mean, truly where this film probably does let itself down the most. So we've got Miriam, she carries Sarah upstairs um, after Sarah has attempted to take her own life and she's intending to put her in a box along with her other lovers and yeah this strange rumbling earthquake occurs and all of the mummies of Miriam's previous lovers come out to, (laughs) as well as John, uh, come out to kind of attack her or you know uh, surround her Mm -hmm. and she, she then rapidly ages as the mummies sort of disintegrate around her turn into dust pillows of dust and she's yeah she almost turns into one of them and i have no idea where this comes from to be honest i i haven't read the book i'd be Mm. interesting to find out how the book whether the book has a similar ending or whether it differs quite a lot because i find that part of the ending quite baffling anyway and then we have this really strange Uh, additional scene tacked onto the end, which it sounds like this was pushed by the studio and yes. wasn't something that they originally wanted as part of the film. But, uh, you know, studios, money, they really wanted to make sure that actually, that you know, allow for a possible sequel. If mm. we want Susan Sarandon to come back, we need to make sure. So she kind of, is Susan Sarandon dead? Is Sarah dead when she goes into that box? I'm not sure, but she somehow comes back. Mm-hmm. And is somehow far. It just absolutely doesn't make any sense, does it? No, nope, I think you're totally right. What is right. going on? <laughs> and uh, like Susan Sarandon said that that was a studio decision. And she was like, it makes no sense. It makes no sense for the character. Like she mm. wanted to die because she didn't want to live this life that was thrust upon mm. her by Miriam. It makes total sense. And it's a great ending. It's such a great ending. Yeah. If Sarah had died, the the dramatic sort of, yeah, the dramatic high that that film would have ended on would have been great. And then yeah. just all this weird stuff happens afterwards that kind of ending of miriam being kind of growing old Mm. in 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 very rapidly the same way as her progeny would Mm. do and sort of disintegrating and dying like none of it makes any sense like it's a very cool scene it's very again it kind of is filmed in the same way as the sex scene a lot of slow motion a lot of billowing curtains (laughs) a lot of white doves for some reason there's so many doves in this film so many doves it is like a music video it isn't is. it it's yeah. so strange and i know tony scott was he did direct some music videos i know he certainly did sort of advertising and commercials mm-hmm. but i think maybe music videos as well so i can kind of see the where where some of that has come from but it's oh, it's it's so bizarre there's so much orange at the end as you say <laughs> orange warmth doves it's like a prince video but <laughs> You're like so right. uh, <laughs> oh my god but i love prince and this isn't right this is such a strange it's just a bizarre mm. ending i can't I, I just can't wrap my head around it i don't know why they thought i don't even know why the studio thought they could get away with that because i think that, and i think when people say they don't enjoy this film mm. i mean it it must be hard when to get you know you remember the ending is the the last thing you see and for it to end like that um it does kind of leave a bit of a weird taste in your mouth because it makes absolutely no sense and i wanted to move on to the reception of this film and Mm. how it's evolved since that how it's evolved since then since Mm. its release um so this was not very well received no no performed quite poorly at the box office Mm. despite having david bowie in it which you'd think um, well, actually, all of the cast really it would it would be a huge draw, but it, yeah. it didn't didn't perform well. Critics really hated it by yeah. the sounds of things. It, uh, <laughs> people really really critical of um, yeah, sort of uh, style over substance, mm. and I guess the fact that it doesn't make sense much as well. <laughs> tiny, and tiny bit. Uh, yeah, just that, that 
big elephant in the room mm. but um but later it did become a cult favorite mm. uh gus loved this shit so do i it's <laughs> it must have inspired a lot of wardrobe looks since what do you think about about it has kind of um what do you think about it has kind of inspired this cult status and this love for it amongst the 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 goth subculture i mean for me i love it because it is as you mentioned before such a moment in time mm. um and I mean, I don't feel, I can't feel nostalgic for it because I wasn't alive in 1983, but I don't know, it's such an amazing snapshot in time. Mm. Um, I just absolutely love everything about it. The music and the, yeah, even the the, the editing and the, it's just every, the costumes, it's mm. just, it does feel like an absolute, a moment in time that you can't quite replicate. Before we wrap up, I mm. wanted to touch a little bit on something that we've kind of mentioned here and there throughout mm. our chat, but it's overall, the aesthetics of this film hmm. what do you make of all of the different elements you know like we mentioned before in the with the critics calling it style over substance hmm. and we've talked a lot about goth culture and new wave post-punk music hmm. and the way that they look and the pillowing curtains and all this stuff and like this drawing from an mtv style of um 80s music video direction hmm. um but like how do you think now the the look and feel of this film has aged? I mean, I think it's kind of, I mean, I want to, I feel like I should say it's aged badly because it is so very 80s in lots of ways. You have literal shoulder pads and tailored suits and, you know, Bauhaus, Bela Lugosi's Dead is a very, you know, it is a specific time. Mm. But it does feel quite timeless at the same time. I think there's, uh and i don't know what it is really i just i don't know i just think the way that it's there's there is a legacy there in terms of filmmaking i think i think of things like only lovers left alive and of course that that whole season of american horror story hotel oh this God. kind of oh I, you're a big fan of american horror story aren't you yes absolutely big fan so it it, I th it does have a legacy and i think it mm. does i think people i think it does resonate now mm. but i couldn't quite <laughs> put a finger on why i think it still stands up well let me actually rephrase that question because you've brought mm. up a really interesting point um where do you see the influence of the mm. hunger on more recent films or tv yeah so i was i was thinking about this and off the top of my head, I thought initially, oh, I can't, you know, maybe it didn't have much of a cultural legacy. I know, I know, you know, the goth kind of subculture um, took it in and really embraced it as yeah. a cult classic. But initially I thought, I don't know if there are many examples, mm. but actually two things that really sprung to mind for me were firstly, Only Lovers Left Alive, the two 2013 film with Tilda Swinton, which I have to admit, I don't think I've seen since it was at the cinema, but I did really love it when I saw it. Mm. And I think, am I right in saying that there are, there are definitely parallels there, aren't there? Yes. I think that's a really good comparison. Mm. And same, I haven't seen it since I saw it in the cinema and its original release. And, but yeah, you're right. Like the dynamic between them, um, I think it's a lot bloodier yes. and a lot more physical mm. um a lot less billowing curtains yes fewer curtains they probably moved on to blinds at that point <laughs> or something but uh and i i do vaguely remember there was quite a lot of classical music in that as well and there's a <laughs> there's a real mix of um different kind of yeah cultural touch points in mm -hmm. that isn't there there's a lot of yeah. different types of culture and music and art that is kind of referenced and then the other one was of course and this is very obvious is american horror story hotel yes. which is an entire homage i think to to the hunger absolutely are you an american horror story fan i am so i have i seen all seasons there might i think a couple of the later seasons mm. cult i didn't watch and i didn't get through apocalypse is it uh -huh. called apocalypse yeah. but I was absolutely here for the first few seasons. Absolutely. And I loved Hotel. I mean, Lady Gaga, it's such an, I mean, that is, they have clearly cast Lady Gaga as a kind of modern take on Catherine Deneuve's. Oh, totally. As a figure. 
And it's so interesting that you bring it up because as I was rewatching the film, I was mm. like, holy shit, this entire first scene is <laughs> yes. literally lifted yes. by American Horror Story Hotel. Yeah. And because I haven't rewatched this film in such a long time, but I have rewatched um, Hotel a few times in the last couple yeah. of years. It's, it is my favorite uh, American Horror Story season as well. But there is yeah. literally for anyone who hasn't seen it, and it's not a spoiler, it's, it's in the first episode yeah. where Lady Gaga, who's like this all powerful vampire and is very visually very much modeled i think on Catherine mm, Deneuve's Miriam mm. who i think in turn is modeled on Delphine Seyrig from Daughters of Darkness in the oh, styling okay. of her like the the design of her character the red mm. lips the way she's shot even like half mm. in darkness it's all like there's a long trajectory of how this like sort of classy female vampire mm. that is the dominating force is presented on screen. Mm. But I digress kind of in American Horror Story Hotel in the first episode, there's literally a scene where they go out on a hunt and it's all to the tune of this song called She Wants Revenge and they go see. Oh, yes. yes. I remember that now. See, I haven't. I haven't rewatched Hotel. I would really like to, though. I think I have to. But That's I do great. remember there being moments with uh, the soundtrack in particular yeah. that at the time I watched and went, oh, the soundtrack is so integral to this moment totally. in the show. And the parallels there with the hunger, yeah, as you say, it was so, yeah. yeah. I can then... almost, in my memory, I, al <laughs> I can almost... I almost feel like Bauhaus features in Hotel, but I don't think yes. it. I, do they? I don't think they do. No, but no, they don't. But like but in the, my memory, they're yeah. so mixed. So I was about to say like, oh yeah, and they they even use the song, but I don't think they do. They're just kind of they they've merged. Are, they literally like have the same dynamic where they get mm. ready, they get glammed up, they go on the prowl, they, they pick, go out, they pick up a couple, mm. and they like switch, and they're having mm. sex with them simultaneously, as mm. in the hunger, and mm. also they use a contraption in this case, in the case of oh, HS, yeah, they use like a, a diamond fingernail that's very mm. sharp to slash their throats and drink mm. their blood. Similarly to this, like they don't actually bite them; mm. they use a weapon to um to drain them. Mm. Which I was like, holy shit, literally entirely lifted the vibe of the first scene of The Hunger. Wow. I mean, I love it. But also, yeah. I wonder how many people picked up on it at the time. And obviously, if you're a big fan of The Hunger, you would. But I, ha I wonder how many other viewers of American mm. Horror Story that probably went over a lot of people's heads, didn't it? I don't know. I mean, I definitely... I should have picked up on it at the time, but I definitely <laughs> didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the other... I did read somewhere that mm. Brian Fuller um, of Hannibal, you know, the showrunner yes. for Hannibal, he also cited The Hunger as an influence on Hannibal, oh. which I can kind of see. Yeah. I think. Sort of. It's got some amazing tailoring in that <laughs> yes, show. So, you know, that and some amazing houses. So mm. that kind of, I can kind of vaguely see it a little bit there. So those were, <laughs> yes, sort of the key examples for me that I got. Were there any others that you could think of? Um, well, I was thinking of actually not so much Hannibal, although I can see it. I can definitely mm. see the relationship with Daughters of Darkness. Mm. And I can... Mm, I was thinking of True Blood is not a good comparison because it's can, it's, yeah. it's kind of... It's trashier. Like, it's yes. much trashier. <laughs> um, I love... I rewatched True Blood this year, actually. That was my first lockdown activity <laughs> and I bloody loved it. I mean, I, I, I've got it in Blu-ray. I am I'm yes. going straight to hell. But <laughs> <laughs> but I was actually thinking, as you mentioned it, of this Zoe Cassavetes film called Kiss of the Damned, mm -hmm. which is nowhere near as kind of visually, stylistically as specific as this film mm -hmm. um it's a lot warmer it's a lot more kind of only lovers left alive uh, but it is kind of a, a similar erotic horror dynamic mm. and a very much you know arguably has a much more is much more concerned about style than it is about a cohesive narrative mm. Mm. And, oh interesting no I, mean, I haven't seen that so i know that there is a tv show called the hunger that was produced by oh. the production company but by the scott brothers but uh i and bowie presented one of them in this sort of you know like horror host oh um, really is this the one that with the horrific cover on wikipedia because yes. i i clicked on it and went oh no not even yeah. gonna no 
dope. Yeah, <laughs> the cover, the cover on the Wikipedia and the and the Blu-ray, I think, looks like an like an off t- like a um a shoot from a promotional shoot for True Blood, so mm-hmm. it doesn't really look of its time. But apparently, very very filtered. Yeah, crazy filtered. Yeah, Terrence Stamp and David Bowie were the presenters for the two seasons, oh. and I haven't seen it. And apparently, it has nothing to do with the film itself. Oh. <laughs> Does not just stole the name. name. Yep, yep, pretty much. I mean, I guess they own the AP or whatnot, but yeah, mm. it's just a, a horror series. I'm actually going to check it out, to be honest, because I do like horror TV. I love horror TV. Yeah. I'll watch, to be honest, I'll watch, yeah, I'll give, I'll always give horror TV of any kind a go. And anything um, with David Bowie or Terrence Stamp. Oh, so much. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I feel kind of bad for this film now in that I, I really enjoy it and I really <laughs> rate it as a vampire film. <laughs> And I wonder, in the history of sort of vampire films, whether this does show up very much as a key, a key moment mm. in in film history. I don't know. I feel a bit bad for it now. Maybe it's not as. Yeah, I feel a bit. I I completely see what you what you mean because I think one of the dangers of um, horror criticism let's Mm. say is sometimes disregarding films that perhaps don't emphasize the violence as much Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i think i I think this film is very interesting but it's really leaning heavily into the the sex element and the erotic element Mm -hmm. of vampires on screen Mm. as opposed to the mythology oh the story doesn't really make sense as we've discussed (laughs) but like that's hardly the point it's more about Mm. atmosphere and mood and the sort of overall vibe as opposed to it is yeah this is the this is the way that vampires work in this universe Mm -hmm. which i i have a lot of time for i don't know about you i'm i'm okay with having both i am quite happy to sit and watch this film and just absorb as you say the Mm. the overall look and the atmosphere um and just the vibe that it gives off and it is incredibly everything about it is you know inve- incredibly well put together and beautiful mm. and it's very slick in a lot of ways um and i, I i'm ha- quite happy to sit with that and not dig too much deeper uh into although we have a little bit you know i don't need to dig too too much deeper into the yeah. the story itself and there are kind of arguments that of you know with a lot of vampire um mm. a lot of vampire stories films and books that you know there are talk around um addiction and mm. about the aids epidemic because i know this film came out in 83 which was very early in the kind of aids epidemic where things were starting to show up on tv and yeah. were being talked about a lot more mm. and i think you could dig into that but at the same time i don't know it's sort of in our conversation now it hasn't naturally come up for me because yeah. I don't, I think you can make a case for it, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's entirely the point. <laughs> no, I don't think it's the point, but I think it's really interesting that you're bringing it up because mm. you're, you're absolutely right. Like if you put it in the context of what was happening in, uh, in the world and in kind of big cities in the States in particular mm. um, at that time, and the fact that it is a lot about the exchange of bodily fluids mm. and mm. that someone, and about this, er- uncontrollable disease um i mean it is it can be under control now but at that Mm. point it was the closest thing to a plague yeah people had experienced absolutely Um, and it you know people were i think because this was so early i think they had just made a connection um I think I read it was sort of eight, it was literally a year before mm. that scientists had made the connection with AIDS um, being a sexually transmitted disease mm-hmm. and they had found evidence of this in um, homosexual men. Mm. So there is a case to be made around, you know, uh, the, the presentation of, sort of bisexual relationships mm-hmm. and fear around, you know, bisexual relationships and sex and all, you know, there's a whole a whole other discussion to be have around that i think and it does it could be seen to tap into a concern as vampires always do really that's mm. why that's why i love vampires as well i think they're inc- firstly i just think vampires are really sexy and cool mm-hmm. they're the coolest monsters there are yeah. but at the same time of course as with a lot of horror as well vampires can be used um to yeah to really tap into those fears of the time mm. across the decades yeah and i think 
you're just here listening to you now i'm kind of thinking of something that i hadn't considered before mm. with this film is that i mean absolutely agree with you that vampires are are the most also sexually fluid of monsters mm. Mm. so they're the ones that because they literally um deal with sex and death mm -hmm. they are very often um and as i flippantly kind of pointed out before they're very often presented as pansexual like they yes. they're kind of go beyond um closed off mm. um definitions because yeah. you know it's kind of inherent into this idea of if you're living forever and you're getting to experience so much time and life and times time periods then it naturally seems that your sexuality would also transform it like you know sexuality yeah. is a spectrum anyway so yeah you'd kind of be be beyond defining yeah, things on like, a spectrum wouldn't you exactly and especially because like if you think of the idea of living forever you're kind of gonna go with and transform alongside society mm. and kind of live next to it but not be beholden to the rules because mm. you're you live outside of time but i'm also thinking of the way that this film kind of really dispenses with the male characters really quickly mm. and i wonder if that's something to do with what you were talking about and the context in which it's made it's because mm. it's it's really the the main um queer relationship here is between miriam and sarah and john is dispatched really quickly yeah and sarah's boyfriend is also dispatched very unceremoniously oh i can't even remember remember his name yeah like, me what is his name paul I'm like, D boyfriend mm. <laughs> sarah's boyfriend yeah so which i also find kind of quite interesting and it kind of taps into this slightly more problematic thing of the way that um especially straight men mm -hmm. view female sexuality or, or bisexual women as just not so much in control of their sexuality mm. but rather there for their viewing pleasure mm -hmm. and actually that's kind of just a performance as opposed mm. to a part of who they are and their and you know a part of their sexuality so it's it, it does kind of skirt around that as we've discussed mm. around that sex scene of like there's a little bit of yeah this is just softcore porn for for the dudes but yes yeah, it's it's skirting around that, but I do find it interesting, like how there's not that many examples in horror or in screen media anyway of mm. of bisexual women where they are they are, like they can't just be attracted to each other and they can't be attracted to men at the same time. Mm, that's interesting. That was actually something I'd put as a question mark to ask you about. Was sort of yeah, whether there was a, a traditional many other examples of sort of similar. Yeah, a similar presentation of bisexuality in women. So that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think it's like, you know, it's like we talked about before, it does kind of tap into this very softcore porny 80s mm. thing where it's just, you know, oh my God, it's two girls kissing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. It's no. <laughs> but uh, I think it kind of like we talked about before, I think it maybe, I think maybe this is part of the the audience mm -hmm. reading more into it because yes there, because there isn't there hasn't been or there hadn't been up until that point like that much especially not mm. on this level with this level of stars yeah and um budget really so you kind of as with everything you kind of grasp onto what you can get yep it is interesting to think about. Now I'm just thinking about that scene again. I know. I just can't. <laughs> it, it does make me die a little bit. <laughs> With happiness, but also the cringe factor. Yes. So, Steph, to wrap up, is there anything about this film that you wanted to bring up that we haven't touched upon? I don't think so. I, th I do. I really enjoy this film. And... I'm I'm quite interested in the the ideas of kind of aging and loneliness as well that come mm. with this film because as we I think you touched on before like it is a it's very sexually charged but it's also very sad like John has to come to terms very quickly with his own loss of youth and mm. there's a moment where uh, I think Sarah assumes that Miriam must have lots of friends and parties to go to and kind of asks mm. you know are you lonely but I don't know that's something that I end up every time I rewatch this film or when I have rewatched this film recently um, I don't know it struck me as a lot sadder this time mm. round than it did before all of her poor lovers you know being damned to lie in a box for alone forever I almost can't think about that because it's un it's, it's an unbearable thought that's a very that's a very good point 
I don't mean to end on a sad note, obviously. But. It's kind of a sad film. And I think you're right. It does tap into this idea of, yeah, you live forever and you're gorgeous and rich and all of that. But also you're doomed to always be by yourself. Mm, by yourself mm. looking for the next fix you yeah. are quite literally an addict and it's yeah it's 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 not a great it's not a great swap is it not a great bargain to make no but the the outfits make it worth it i just think i really do recommend this film even i would recommend that sort of modern audiences watch this film if you haven't mm -hmm. seen it before i think it's a really interesting snapshot in time of the 80s and yeah it just it for look and feel alone i just think it's so cool it's amazing and it's got such a strong cast it really does you can't go wrong with these three actors whilst also at the same time acknowledging that there are some big flaws in it <laughs> too but it's just got to be i just have i think it has to be experienced steph thank you so much for your time and for your glorious insight into this film oh, um, thank you so much for having me so where can people find out more about your work online uh so you can find me on twitter i'm at steph x mckenna uh, i run i'm on two podcasts so i do a podcast called the thirst which is a pop culture podcast uh, that I run with my co-host April and we talk, uh, we do kind of news and reviews about recent releases and then we focus on a few key topics of our choosing. And then I also uh, am a co-host on a weekly podcast called The Writing Life, which is writing focused. It's a podcast from the National Centre for Writing, which is where I work and myself and Simon talk every week with writers from all walks of life about their writing journey um, sort of practical tips ways to stay motivated you know ways uh, top tips for the genres that they write in as well and so if you're a reader or a writer and you like any of that kind of insight i would definitely recommend giving that a listen to um and yeah just come follow me on twitter and I, I just yeah talk films talk vampires all of that kind of stuff awesome thank you so much steph thank you that's it for this episode of the Final Ghost Podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. If you can, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And you can find out more about what we do and subscribe to our weekly newsletter over on thefinalghost.co.uk. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Final Ghost UK. And you can find Steph on Twitter at Steph X McKenna. And I'm at Anna B. Demented. Thank you for listening. And next week... We're diving back into the 60s and 70s with a combination of very weird exploitation vampire flicks.